Welcome back to the seventh video of the Edinburgh Guide to the PSA. This video will focus on section seven, drug monitoring. This section assesses your ability to monitor for beneficial and harmful effects of medicines and to identify the most appropriate methods to do so. Common tasks involve deciding which measurement provides the most useful information in a given context and deciding when such a measurement should be taken. This often refers to a blood sample. In the PSA, this section comprises eight questions worth 16 marks, or 8% of the entire exam. To provide some context, this section was originally called Therapeutic Drug Monitoring, hence the acronym TDM. In the literature, this refers to drugs which are dose adjusted based on the blood concentrations of a drug. You may think of insulin as the quintessential example of TDM, but recall that we measure blood glucose instead of directly measuring insulin to adjust the dosage. TDM refers to directly measuring concentrations of the drug in question. We'll see some examples of this shortly. Each drug monitoring question will ask you to select the most appropriate option to either monitor for the beneficial or adverse effects of a prescription after a specified time period of treatment. Notice that we're not merely focused on the adverse effects as in the previous section on adverse drug reactions. But here, we're also monitoring for the beneficial effects, i.e. is our treatment working as intended? And also note that each question specifies a time point. Think about the differences between monitoring the effects of treatment in the acute setting, within an hour or two, for example, by monitoring vital signs, versus within the chronic context after three months or so. In the PSA, Scenarios usually involve a patient who has just been commenced on a drug regimen and requires monitoring. Also note that the PSA tries to make this section as objective as possible. Therefore, your monitoring options are unlikely to be immeasurable. It will tend to focus more on options which are at least partially objective, such as changes on auscultation, but more frequently will focus on objective measures, such as urinalysis, blood tests, imaging and specialist investigations, such as ECGs. High yield content covered in this section includes drugs such as digoxin, insulin, methotrexate, antibiotics and antipsychotics, as well as any possible effects post fluid replacement or blood transfusion. In the PSA, scenarios usually involve a patient who has just been commenced on a drug regimen and requires monitoring. To place these concepts into context, let's walk through three questions. So, question one. This is a 13-year-old boy who presents to a &E with a one-day history of abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and increasing polyuria and polydipsia. This is on a background of type 1 diabetes for which he takes a basal bolus insulin regimen comprising one long-acting injection and three short-acting doses per day. The vital signs references for a child older than 12 are almost equivalent to that of an adult's. Thus, he is mildly tachycardic and moderately tachypneic, whilst his oxygen sats and GCS look promising. He has Kuzmil's breathing and acetone breath. His BMI is low. His white cells are raised and his blood glucose is through the roof. He is hyponatremic, hyperkalemic and has a raised urea and creatinine. His capillary ketones are at 7.4 millimoles per litre and he's acidotic with a pH of less than 7.3. He is retaining CO2 and his bicarbonate is low. In other words, he's in metabolic acidosis. The child is treated with plain saline over one hour and of note, a fixed rate insulin infusion. This question asks you to select the most appropriate monitoring option to assess for the adverse effects of this treatment over the next 24 hours. I now encourage you to pause the video and consider your answer. Now that you've considered your answer, I'll walk you through this question. It should be fairly obvious, but this question is focusing on diabetic ketoacidosis in a child. The Kuzmil's breathing and acetone breath are pathognomic for diabetic ketoacidosis. 
Criteria for diagnosis include a blood pH of less than 7.3, i.e. acidosis, a blood ketone level of more than 3 millimoles per litre, and a blood glucose level of more than 11.1 millimoles per litre. So, the question asks you to measure the adverse effects of this treatment within the first 24 hours. So the first question is, what is the treatment? And the answer, fluid resuscitation with plain saline and insulin. So, let's take a look at our options. The correct answer for this case is GCS and vital signs. But why? Without even considering the stem of the question, you should be able to rule out HbA1c as an option, since it is a measure of the last three months, and thus it is very unlikely to be relevant in the acute setting. Blood glucose lowering is a good sign of the benefit of treatment and may point out hypoglycemia, but capillary blood glucose is not usually reliable in cases of acidosis or with poor peripheral perfusion, such as in dehydration. Although reduced urine output may indicate poor renal perfusion when in DKA and should inform fluid resuscitation, it is not the most appropriate measure within the first 24 hours. In this question, you should think about why DKA is so dangerous. In this case, inappropriate fluid resuscitation and electrolyte imbalances are the most life-threatening complications. In DKA, high extracellular glucose causes water from intracellular spaces to move into the extracellular space. As insulin is administered, fluid shifts back into the intracellular space rapidly, which can lead to edematous cells and therefore cerebral edema. Whole body potassium is generally low in DKA because insulin drives potassium into cells. However, this results in serum potassium being high. Once insulin is started and potassium is driven back into cells, it can lead to dangerously low levels of potassium so, in this question, cerebral edema and severe hypokalemia are key considerations. Monitoring an ECG for signs of T-wave changes that occur with both high and low potassium levels is a good idea, but serum potassium will provide a much clearer early warning sign and is not an option here. Therefore, we should focus on cerebral edema. Early signs include a headache, agitation, irritability, and a fallen heart rate, whilst late signs include a dropping GCS, abnormal breathing patterns, seizures, and pupillary inequality or dilatation. This is a difficult case, but thinking back to first principles should lead you to the correct answer. On a side note, in this child who is 13 years old, we can use the Glasgow Coma Scale without issue. However, in very young children, we may consider the Adelaide Coma Scale instead. I hope that explanation has been clear and has demonstrated the importance of using GCS and vital signs to monitor for the adverse effects in the treatment of DKA. So let's move on to question two and take a look at another paediatric question. This is a very common presentation that you will have come across if you've spent any time in the paediatric assessment unit or within A&E. This is a nine-year-old girl who presents to A&E with wheeze and breathlessness. She is unable to complete sentences. 10 puffs of salbutamol twice, 15 minutes apart, have not relieved her symptoms. She is known to have asthma, which is usually treated with an inhaled corticosteroid twice daily, oral montelukast once daily, and a salbutamol reliever. Both of her parents are smokers. On examination, she is tachypneic, her oxygen sats are 91% breathing air and there are signs of respiratory distress. On auscultation, you can hear a wheeze throughout her chest and reduced air entry on the right. Her peak flow is 45% of predicted. She is a normal weight for a nine-year-old girl. Upon her arrival to A&E, she is treated with a combined salbutamol and ipotropium bromide nebulizer every 20 minutes for three doses. The question focuses on the beneficial effects of immediate treatment, once again within the acute setting, one hour after treatment commences. Once again, you should pause here to think of your answer. Now let's walk through the question and compare your answer to ours. This scenario relates to an acute asthma exacerbation, and if we look at the last line of the stem, 
we'll see that the drugs in question are salbutamol, a short-acting beta agonist, and ipatropine bromide, a short-acting muscarinic antagonist. This is a combination nebulizer. Occasionally, you'll come across a similar combination with the addition of inhaled magnesium sulfate, sometimes referred to as a meganeb. It is normal for up to three doses to be given to a child, because it is unlikely that a child will completely respond with only one nebulizer alone. Whenever thinking about the child with acute asthma, it's worth recalling two things. One, what is the severity of the asthma? And two, has the patient previously received IV therapy or been admitted to the paediatric ICU due to their asthma, as these are both red flags. It is worth noting that the cutoff for severe or life-threatening asthma is an oxygen saturation level of less than 92%. Thus, our nine-year-old patient is either in severe or life-threatening asthma. We know that she cannot complete sentences and she has marked accessory muscle use with chest wall recessions. However, she is not cyanosed her peak expiratory flow is not less than 33% and she does not have a silent chest. Thus, this girl is having a severe asthma exacerbation. So, if we look at the answers, we can see that the correct answer is the final option, respiratory rate. This would be the most important observation to monitor, as any changes could indicate an improvement or deterioration and would change in the acute setting. Let's now go through the other answers and why they are incorrect. So, the first option, changes on auscultation. There may be improved or reduced air entry and presence of additional signs such as wheeze and crackles on auscultation. However, although these are important to monitor for in either an improvement or deterioration, they are unlikely to be the first change to be noted after starting a nebulizer, and hence, it is an incorrect answer. The second option, chest x-ray. It is very unlikely that there will be any chest x-ray changes in an asthma exacerbation, as there is likely to be a viral or allergic trigger. So this will not add much to the assessment and is not useful for monitoring short-term changes. Fractional exhaled nitric oxide, or FENO testing, may be used to assist diagnosis, aid chronic management, and to identify poor adherence to treatment, However, in the acute setting, as asked in this question, it plays no role. And finally, peak flow. This is useful for determining the severity of exacerbation compared to a baseline, for example in the days leading up to admission. However, it is not as useful a monitoring tool when in the hospital, as repeated readings may be difficult for a child in the short term when they are acutely short of breath. I hope that all makes sense and that this question has highlighted for you the different types of asthma and their treatment. Now, let's move on to our third and final question. This is a 48-year-old woman who presents to the emergency department with a two-day history of fever, severe right-sided abdominal pain and jaundice. Her past medical history includes episodic biliary colic. She has no known allergies and drinks two glasses of wine every night. On examination, she is pyrexial and has a heart rate on the high side of normal. All other vital signs are within range. Her abdomen is soft with tenderness in the right upper quadrant region and she weighs 84 kilograms. She is treated with ERCP alongside once daily gentamicin and eight hourly metronidazole. This question asks you to select the most appropriate monitoring option to assess the adverse effects of gentamicin after 72 hours of treatment. So, time again to pause here and consider your answer. Now that you've considered your answer, let's go through the question. The key points that you should take from this clinical presentation are the patient's symptoms are indicative of a biliary tract infection and her subsequent treatment with gentamicin in a once daily dose regimen. As gentamicin can cause numerous adverse effects, there may be a number of correct monitoring options, so you should identify the most appropriate one for this patient in this scenario. The correct answer for this question is D, serum gentamicin concentration one hour before treatment. 
Drug monitoring is required for gentamicin as it has a narrow therapeutic range and inappropriate serum levels can cause irreversible nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity. Therefore, gentamicin requires both pre- and post-dose serum testing to determine the peak and trough serum concentrations respectively. If the serum concentrations are elevated, this will result in significant adverse effects, so it is imperative this is monitored closely and appropriate dose adjustments are implemented. As this patient is receiving gentamicin in a once daily regimen, the most appropriate monitoring option is to determine the trough levels by measuring pre-dose concentrations. Let's now consider the incorrect answers. Whilst gentamicin is known to cause nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity, the patient does not have a history of renal impairment, so neither creatinine clearance or Weber tests are appropriate monitoring investigations for the overall adverse effects of the treatment, meaning options A and B are incorrect. Option C, this is a frequency of testing that is not appropriate for a once daily dose regimen and will be unnecessarily disruptive for the patient. And finally, option E, post-dose concentrations reflect the peak gentamicin levels and are more appropriately used to monitor serum concentrations in multiple daily dose regimens. I hope this explanation has been clear and demonstrates the importance of identifying the most appropriate monitoring option in relation to the clinical scenario. I hope you've enjoyed this video as part of the Edinburgh Guide to the PSA series. For further study resources, please visit our website. And if you have any queries about anything covered in this video, please contact our team via email or Facebook. If you have a minute to spare, we'd love if you could complete the feedback form linked below in the description. We look forward to seeing you in our next video, Section 8, Data Interpretation. Huh.